We started uh, doing that with your Tunnox tea cakes from last year. I know my year nines and tens have loved it. A great opportunity to start getting into talking about the NEA um, uh, as far as presentation, NEA 2 for presentation side of things. So to, uh, uh, I think there was an announcement on Thursday, something about that. Could be wrong. Um, so, yes, we are, we are now going to get ready for uh, our next presenter here. Um, you may have seen her at previous Food Teacher Centre events uh, at other parts of London we went to. Um, this is Ros here, and otherwise you may have known him as At Teacher to Toolkit. Um, the most followed purse educator in the whole of the UK on social media. Uh, Multi-award winning. Uh, bl Blogger, author, teacher, deputy head teacher. Um, he's had over food, and obviously design technology DT teacher. teacher. The DT teacher, the most important thing of a lot. Absolutely. Uh, DT teacher, the most important thing of a lot, with over uh, 25 years experience in schools. Three books are behind him, and uh, this being one of them on the board here. I'd like to, uh, to hand over to Ross. Thank you ever so much for joining us. We're oh, really pleasure. privileged to have you here, and we're really looking forward to this. So thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I love being here. Thank you, Louise. Um, who was here four years ago when I was last here? Hands up. Okay. So um, I hope, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to share lots of new ideas with you today, but if you've not uh, had an opportunity to hear me before, um, all the ideas come from a pragmatic background, which you'll be pleased to hear. Um, I want you to have your phones out, please, because I'm going to get you to do some feedback on the screen, and I want you to get a bit of paper you can do a little drawing on. So if you can grab a pen, that would be really useful, um, too. Um, so that's me. Uh, you know, for people that in the room will probably know my story last time we met, but uh, for new people... Um, I started blogging 10 years ago uh, when I lost my job as a senior teacher. Um, my boy was born premature, so I started blogging as a, as a dad um, to communicate with my family about all the things that he was going through. So he was born one pound nine ounces, 700 grams. Uh, very traumatic, that alone, never mind losing your job at the same time. Uh, but when he got home safe, I started writing a blog about teaching uh, for therapy. And then uh, six or eight weeks later, I got back into a school with all the stigma associated about being redundant, you know, are you difficult to work with? Um, what's wrong with you? Is it them or us? You know, all sorts of things. But um, I kept on blogging. It's become a habit. Uh, and it's now read all around the world, 250,000 followers, which is very flattering. But I'm just Ross. I'm just sharing ideas. I've just made blogging a habit to a point where I've got a, quite a large voice, I suppose. Um, and it's led to all flattering things such as books uh, and being asked to speak at events. Um, Last year, I've been training all around the country, teachers, so I've committed to doing it full-time. Uh, I've just started my doctorate at Cambridge, uh, looking at how social media influences education policy. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you kind of know the occasional rants that I let out and how I'm trying to change the dialogue. Um, but that's me. Um, so what I would like to go through, I'm, I've got tons of stuff to try and squeeze in 60 minutes. So I don't know if I'll get through them all, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, I want you to go away with at least one or two things that you can try in your classroom. Um, and while, while we do this, I want you to just, um, if you can get this web address on your browser, please, on your phone, uh, so on Chrome or Safari, whatever you've got, it can all be lowercase. And while you're doing that, I'm going to increase your cognitive overload by asking lots of questions while you do that as well. So hands up if you are a NQT in the room. Any NQTs? Okay, fantastic. Nice to see you here. Um, People with responsibility who have to direct and manage other people, okay. School leaders in the room? School leaders, okay, welcome. Any part-timers? Okay, quite a lot of part-timers, good, that's really good to see. Um, how come I asked to go part-time before an Ofsted inspection and then after Ofsted had happened, I wasn't allowed to go part-time? That's interesting, isn't it? Um, anyway, there's more part-time requests than ever before if you look at the Department for Education census. Um, any bloggers in the room? Food bloggers? Come on. Okay, well done. This is an opportunity today for us to big up design technology and food. So the hashtag food tea center, I want you to be taking pictures. At the moment, I'm going to ask you all to take a selfie. And we're going to tweet it to the world or Instagram or Facebook. If you're not up for that, that's fine. But we have to celebrate the arts in the current government agenda where it's narrow-minded. And dare I say, people don't quite understand how to measure a good plate of food, when, it, when you do, and we understand that assessment and the work that's gone in, I think that's partly the problem. 
Anyway, I'll come to that all shortly. On your phone, it should automatic refresh. Tell me what we had for breakfast. I just want you to get used to the software. First image is nothing. Coffee, tea, milk, juice, toast, jam, cereal, porridge, rice, a full English croissant, fruit, yogurt, or a muesli bar. What did you have? Porridge. Look, we have a room of food tech teachers <laughs> and five people, nine people, are probably... Um, I had a full English this morning and a cup of coffee, so I'm quite in a good place. We've also got some online to take part of. All right, fantastic. Okay, so that's just get warmed up. So you can see this is poll everywhere. I use this as a free and a played for version, and we've had 131 votes. Okay, it's great for the classroom. It's good for training days, and it's great for school assemblies. Okay, next one. Teachers need feedback. How am I doing so far? If you're not happy, let me know. If you're, think I'm, if you're not sure, you haven't worked me out yet, if we're in the middle, or if I'm doing okay. Okay, if I don't know, right. Where are you? <laughs> okay, right, next one. <laughs> one word, what's your workload issue? Reports, press submit. Do it again, press another word, type it in, submit. Get it off your chest, even if you sit next to your line manager, they won't know it's anonymous. Okay, when I ask this to trainee teachers, they do rude words because they haven't quite yet learned the teacher standards. So keep it clean, there's no filter. Okay, so the more word, times the word goes in, the larger it gets. So it didn't take long for the boogie word to appear. Now I've asked 12 to 14,000 teachers, I think, from memory of the last 12 months, this same question. And in every school, in every setting, internationally and all around the country, England, Scotland, Wales, that word comes up. What if we replace that word with feedback? Mm -hmm. Suddenly it looks different. I'm going to feed back to you on your work. Okay? What type of feedback? Written, verbal, maybe nonverbal. Okay? Lots of different ways to give feedback. I could do it right now or I can tell you in a week's time. So marking is blighting teachers across the country. So we have to, I think the root cause is exam board specifications actually, but on our own level in classrooms, school leaders in the room, and that means all leaders, not just SLT, we have to change the dialogue. For the last 25 years, I've not yet discovered the most effective form of marking. I've got some good ideas of what might work in DT, but as a school leader across the whole school, from maths to languages, there's no one size fits all. So we have to allow departments to go off piece and do their own thing. And if you tell a department to mark five times a month or one time, once a week, it's not conducive. It's not helpful and you're driving teacher workload. In the current climate where we don't have enough teachers, that's a problem. Okay, next one. Do you grade lessons, not grade lessons? Do you grade your teachers? Do you grade appraisal? So it's A or B, C or D, E or F. Or do you grade teachers' mark books? What do you do in your school, college or FE setting? Okay. One hundred and fifty votes so far. Okay. Now this is this is quite scary. Did you just say that word? Okay. This is very scary. I've not seen these results before. This is shocking. Two thousand fourteen. Myself and a few other bloggers were invited to Ofsted headquarters. We challenged the notion that it's unreliable, a poor proxy that I can come into your classroom and tell you how good you are in a snapshot. And schools four years later are still doing this to teachers. Okay, Tell, you think I can come to your school on Monday morning and grade your lesson, I've got no chance. And I have observed, whether it's five minutes or a 60 minute lesson, in the last 70 years of my school leadership career, I reckon 40, 50,000 lessons. Popping in, hi, hello, how are you doing? Making a quick judgment, learning walks. It's not a reliable measure. There are other ways of looking at quality teaching, which is why I think Ofsted are now moving to quality of education, rather than teach and learn and assessment. So if you're doing that, my provocation, I'd find another school, if you can. I don't know what this looks like, how you do this, but appraisal. Michael Go follows me on Twitter. I've got no idea why. I have met the man. <laughs> I have met the man, and I've told him, Michael, you've made performance-related pay statutory, but there's zero evidence to show that it improves classroom performance, learning, or me as a teacher. I'll jump through hoops to get evidence to hope that my head teacher gives me that pay rise, but we know... American Scientific Association, 2014, I'm a good teacher, so is Louise. 
We both get up to 15% impact on kids' outcomes. The other 85% is out of our control. I work with kids in gangs and knives. Louise works on the coast. All the kids go surfing. They get tutoring, Wi-Fi, etc., etc., etc. Okay, demographics, postcodes. You have mum and dad at home. I don't, etc. These things are out of our control. We only try to narrow the gap. And I think by grading schools, I think we're exacerbating social mobility and exclusion. No evidence. Show me the evidence. Someone send it to me. Where is the evidence to say marking a teacher's mark books improves learning? Where is it? Show it to me. Where's the purple pen of progress evidence? Where is it? Show it to me. Show it to me. There's no evidence. Large multi-academy trusts, whole school manufacturer, are ranking teachers every six weeks from my research and insights through social media. I have teachers sending me anonymous, e well, they're sending me emails, I'm sharing them anonymously, um, or screenshotting them out to the world, where, teach where schools are doing bad things. And I think it could be because of the system that then drives these bad decisions in schools. And this is exacerbating teacher workload and mental health. It was Mental Health Week last week, or the week before. When last did your school talk about teacher mental health? We're good at talking about kids, but what about our own? Okay, so context for today. Professor Dylan William, okay, he wrote Assessment for Learning, the original black box book. We all think it is assessment of learning, red, amber, green, colour code and cells. It's assessment art for learning. I ask you a question. You can't spell the word volcano. I internally d decide what to do next, and I now evaluate the learning. Dylan says this. Now, I've been to a school. I've been to uh, probably 100 schools in the last year, more than ever in my entire career. One school in the Swiss Alps facing Mont Blanc, not only is it £95,000 a year for fees, second most expensive school in the world, but they have skiing on the curriculum. So why don't you have skiing on your curriculum? You don't know? It would be quite a good thing to do, wouldn't it? So because we don't live on a mountain, of course we're not going to have skiing. But every child in that school has to do skiing, and the staff. Context. They're on a mountain, and they'll be probably snowed in many more days than we ever will here. We all go, hooray, a day at home. Okay, this quote. So when I share something you don't like, it might work in my school experience, but it might not work in yours. And can I just uh, check? I didn't ask. Uh, anyone work with early years? Primary teachers in the room, hands up. Primary. Secondary. <coughs> FE. So adult education higher, anybody? Okay, so you've got a real mix. Okay, people work with four-year-olds all the way up to uh, adulthood. Okay, and again, it doesn't matter where you are. We're all at different stages. And I see training, teacher training, as like a car MIT. I passed my test. I might have been 18, but you might have been 25. It doesn't matter. We both passed the test. But we still have to regularly reflect. It's like an MOT. Pump the tyres up, check the wipers every year. We get better at research, cognitive science, evidence, and then we need to tweak our interventions and approaches, and that's really important. It can't be you qualify and that's it. I'm just going to sail on for the next 40 years until I'm 68. It doesn't work like that. We need to constantly refine. Take a quick picture of this or write it down. You need a capital T and a capital P to grab, um, to grab loads of resources. While you're at it, let's everyone take a selfie or something or a picture of the screen or even me. And uh, we'll get this all shared out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And let's big up design technology. Okay, let's support the arts. Hashtag food tea center. So in this pack, loads of work, loads of tips, loads of videos, loads of things I've found on my travels, loads of resources from me. Uh, I'll stick the slides in after the event, or I'll send them to Lee and you can circulate them. Um, but yeah, grab a quick selfie, everyone. The yeah, person yeah. next to you. Okay, hashtag food tea centre. In fact, I'm going to grab one. Okay, everyone, give me a wave. Okay, I'll get that tweeted out later. Right. Okay, back to some serious business now. Okay. Let's see. So this is my starting point five years ago when I started to really look at my own workload, the teachers that I was responsible for, plus the support staff, about 220 of them, um, in a huge school. This was Nicky Morgan. Do you remember Nicky Morgan? Okay. Secretary of State, when you look at the research, they're in and out every two years, two and a bit years. I think Damien Hines will go by Brexit when we have a big cabinet shuffle. 
The workload challenge, 44,000 teacher responses, the top one, 56%, recording input and data. Hands up if you like putting data on Sims. <laughs> Couple of people. <laughs> okay, what happens if your Sims blows up tonight? How long will it take for kids to notice? <laughs> Second one, marking. Hands up if you like marking. All right, next one. Hands up if you like a meeting. Oh. Cake. Cake meeting, yeah, I'll come to that meeting. Okay. <laughs> So firstly, staff meetings, research shows if you have a stand-up meeting, they'll go quicker. If you have a difficult mum and dad coming, don't sit down, stand up in the corner and have a quick chat. Okay? Um, walk around the school, it's good for your mental health, get out of your office. Japanese schools, they have green, orange, amber lines in some schools I've researched. The green has 60 for 60 minutes, orange 30, red 15. Normal walking pace, you're around the school, you just follow the line, it's got a number on the floor. It's good, get out of your office. If we don't like meetings, why do we do them? We force everyone to go for an hour or two hours after school when they're exhausted to talk about loads of stuff. Okay? Give them a bit of time to go off and actually do it in their working day. Three things we need to fix. Okay? Has anyone looked at the Department for Education Census? Hands up. One person. So just me and Louise are the geeks. Okay. <laughs> this data is 25 years old. So when we look at teacher attrition, it's well known teachers leave in the first five years. Actually, they leave in the first three. Last year, 303 people trained to be a DT teacher. So that's one for every 10 secondary schools. Okay, so when you want a DT teacher, you're cut up against one in the next 10 schools. So let's say 10% don't qualify. So that's 10 or uh, whatever the numbers are, 303, to 15% in the first year after NQT. So already you've lost 25, 15%. 78, 73. So 27% of that 303 DT trainees have gone in the first three years. So if you're in the room, folks, and you're a new teacher, look around where they are. If you work with someone that's new to a profession, that's where we need good quality coaching and mentoring, folks. Or a school where they don't grade you and you've got to jump through a million hoops. Okay? And if you've been teaching a long time like me, I had, so I'm even off the screen, 25 years, I think it was about 38% I was down to. So it drops every 2% you've been in the profession. Now, I think natural wastage happens in any pocket of society. Okay? I don't think we'll ever get 100%. It's just unrealistic. But there are a lot of things we can do, one, to save the taxpayer money, but also to stop good people, including myself, leaving the profession prematurely. There are 35,000 people in the, in the British Navy. In 2025, when the pupil population reaches secondary, we'll need 47,000 teachers. 35,000 in the British Navy, 47,000 teachers we'll need. Okay? Has anyone read the book Outliers? Malcolm Gladwell. So Malcolm bastardised the comment, 10,000 hour rule. So you have to be a doctor, pilot, teacher, 10,000 hours to reach mastery. So if you teach full time, 750 hours an academic year, how long do you need to teach to reach mastery? Anyone mathematician? We should all be mathematicians, food and maths. How long? About 13 years. You need to be in the classroom to reach that 10,000 hours. Okay? So... Let me just show you one more slide. I'm going to get you to vote on the screen. It's not why teachers leave the profession. This was published in June 2018. It's um, not behaviour. It's workload off the pressure. Behaviour's there, and so is salary. Um, but it's actually these reasons why people kind of quit. It's too much. So tell me, how long have you been teaching? Let's see what the experience looks like in here. So I've already kind of gauged a few hands survey questions. So if we need to teach 10,000 hours, and if Gladwell's right, when were you in your mojo really enjoying teaching? For me, it was about my fifth or sixth year when I became a head of department, brand new building, setting up new classrooms, having about a quarter of a million pounds to spend over four years, designing new... It was the best time of my career. Um, and I took risks. I made a few mistakes, but I was really thriving in my career. So let's see what the experience is here. So the 10,000, so we've got about... So it's at the top, it's fluctuating. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't put any statistics on here. It's just ranking. Okay, so um, I can assume... Uh, hands up if you're on the top bracket, six to ten years. Hands up, hands up. So it's probably, what, a, a fifth of the audience? So not a lot. So these people are kind of in the mojo, so to speak. Okay. Uh, right, so enough from me. What would you do? On your screen, you've got 15 choices. What are the top five you would choose? It'll appear on the screen to reduce or reform teacher workload? What do we think the profession thinks? So stick that on your phone. <coughs> 15 choices, the top five appear on the screen. And then I'll try and squeeze in 
lots of ideas in the next, how long have we got? Another 40 minutes, so let's see. Okay, and while these results are appearing, so we've got 200 results on the screen, ask yourself which ones are out of my control. So the top one is, because if Damien Hines doesn't fund the school, then we're never going to fix that. Head teachers' hands are tied. So we have to keep fighting this nationally with social media posts challenging. I mean, Liz Truss, the, Secretary of the Treasure, Chief uh, Secretary for Treasury, has said there's more funding for real terms, but actually the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies has proven that real term funding is down by 8%. She's in charge of the budget, and she's got the stats wrong. She said it on the radio yes, uh, this week. What hope do we have? To those two, mark and data collection. We can do that in our own school. We can change the narrative. If I don't know what effective marking looks like after 25 years, what hope does mum and dad have at home when they last went to school 30 years ago and they still want Miss or Sir to do tick or cross on Freddie's homework at home? Okay. So we need to change the narrative. Let's change the word marking. I challenge all of you to never say the word marking again and say feedback instead. Okay, data collection. I'm going to show you some data shortly. This, parents on the uh, uh, outside the school gates, social media, we need to change the dialogue. There's lots of negative stuff about teaching, but I also sense, particularly through my research, is we're at a place now where social media will give us a voice. And there's loads of demonstrable evidence that I could probably share another time and show you how... Twitter, blogs, all sorts has changed national policy. Um, and again, the bottom one, PISA, they're looking at removing the testings. Finland and Sweet, uh, Singapore, they're always top of the league tables. Guess what? They have Ofsted, but they don't publish the report to the public. And they're now talking about getting rid of the tests. And actually, uh, rumour has it, creativity is going to become a fourth test. So watch this space. That'll be good for all of us. Um, so, quick summary of workload. Get rid of the meetings. We don't like them. I'm not going to them anymore. Okay? Give your staff time to do them. Give, let's come together for half an hour. Half an hour, let's go off and do it. Marking. If your marking policy says you mark once a week or once a month, I'm more concerned, do I mark once a month, rather than am I marking what's right for Louise when she needs it? Okay? Um, Coloured pens. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Now, context, Dylan William, something works somewhere, but not everywhere. If I work in a visually impaired school, special needs, then maybe a purple pen is going to be important for the kids to find what to fix. Context. But if it becomes compliance, art, drama, maths teachers, food teachers, you've all got to use an aqua-coloured pen. One school I've found uses aqua-coloured pens. I can't even find a red pen half the time, never mind <laughs> buying an aqua one from a shop. Um, show me the research. Where is it? Okay. So, quick some ideas. High expectations. Hands up if this looks familiar, this kind of data. Okay, it's a secondary one. There's a primary one, look at that. There's 32 kids there. Hands up if that makes you feel uncomfortable. Okay, anyone make it feel comfortable? Um, now, when I look at this data, I used to think, right, God, it's very helpful once you understand it. You know, for an NQT, I wouldn't know where to start. It'd take me 15, 20 years to be able to master this. But um, am I now in the system of tracking and intervention or assessment of learning? Here you've got 14 kids. Student L is really naughty. Why? Well, I can assume speech language communication is talented in art, low attaining student. He's got a reading age of eight. You know, my perceptions of, of that child before they arrive to my classroom when I get the data exported off Sims. 75, pre, five, 75 primary feeder schools into the secondary school. 12 teachers on the carousel evaluating what a level 5 looks like. That's 12 teachers' versions of what level 5 is in DT. I've written a blog thinking we need to reform how we do curriculum in design technology. It's a matter of do we want experiences or do we want outcomes? If we want outcomes, maybe we should just teach kids one subject for a year and we get better results. Otherwise, when I teach the kids how to thread a sewing machine up, see you in a year, I hope you can remember. <laughs> in a year's time, because you're going to go to three other teachers before I see you again in year eight. <laughs> so that like, experience, yeah, great, but outcomes, they're not going to retain much information. Here is a school that fine grades their kids. So a grade A star, so A star one, A star two, A star three, B, or A, sorry, all the way down to a G3. So you've got nine grades, now it's 27. So I've got in my head, before I put it on Sims, hope that I've got Ross's grade right, and I've got to say effort, homework, behaviour, target grade, on a scale of 27 possibilities. Okay? 
And there's, that's 14 kids. Imagine doing this for... Sorry, my clicker's gone. Um, doing it for 32. On my travels, I met a teacher who's got 39 kids. Has anyone beat 39 kids? Anyone, how many got? 44. Right, OK, I'm going to take that. That's 44. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. I mean, look at all this. Like, where do you start? Take me an hour just to in, understand it and un interpret it. So kind of going to a point, if I, if I look at our data calculator for teacher work, there's 30 kids. I want you to enter data once a term. Well, you can do that. It's easy. 90 decisions. Oh, but I want you to give me the effort, homework, current grade, and target. 30 kids, three times a year. That's 360 decisions. I can do that. It's manageable. Oh, but I want you to do a fine grade now. A1, A2, A3, B1, B2. Make the decisions. Okay. So that's three more. Times three, 30 kids, three times a term, four fields on a nine-point scale, 3,240 decisions you make. On a 27-point scale, it goes to 19,000. That's how many decisions you have to make in your head or on a bit of paper before you put it on Sims. And get it right before your deputy head comes to you and says, your data doesn't match up. But you just have, you have teach more than one class, don't you? Primary teachers, they do English, math, science, they teach five or ten subjects. So do you in a secondary school. So look at the numbers. Five classes, 65. Ten classes, 90,000. Any wonder we get data wrong? Okay? So we need to just reform it. So easy way, so this is my book. Let's look at the data, but it might be misleading. It might be inaccurate. The best thing a teacher does is I assess for learn. Come into my lesson, ten-word spelling test. Louise spells volcano wrong. Well, we won't do volcano food lesson, but pepperoni. I then support her how to spell this. She's a bit naughty. I move her to another seat. I then meet mum and dad. I talk to her outside the lesson. I go and see how she behaves in an art lesson. I triangulate and differentiate her over time. You haven't seen that as a school leader. So when you come and ask me to show differentiation in a lesson in a 20-minute window, I'll say no, because you didn't come and hear me talk to Louise's mum and dad on the phone last night or watch me in her art lesson. Okay? That's me differentiating to try and make my life easier for Louise in the class. Triangulating sources. That's just one child, never mind 30, or if you teach 300. So we need to also pot our perception of what we think differentiation is. Can it be observed in a lesson? I don't think it can. Has anyone heard of the Pygmalion effect? I'm going to show you a video for five minutes because I think it's really important. The research is 60 years old, so it needs probably a bit of critique, but it's still important to share this chap, Robert Rosenthal. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, this. I tell you you've got a naughty class, there's the data, you're going to teach it. What are you going to do? You're going to panic, first of all. Mr. McGill's told me the, the class is a bit naughty and student L is really difficult. I'll, be he I'll, I'll plan more resources or I'll be a bit difficult with Lee's because she can be naughty. Louise arrives, she thinks, oh, Mr. McGill, your lesson's boring or you taught my brother, he thinks you're rubbish. I start to be naughty in the class. So I set a glass ceiling for Louise because she's in set four maths. I'm only ever going to get a grade D because I've been labelled set four. Watch this, and then we'll have a quick chat, and then we'll squeeze in lots of more ideas. Does it make a difference whether your teacher believes that you are a high performer or a low performer? That you are a late bloomer, that even though you haven't demonstrated your intellectual ability, you, know, you, you will blossom. Uh, or you're not a good student, or you're a good student. Psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson did a remarkable study some years ago in which they told school teachers, elementary school teachers, that on the basis of some uh, psychological test, some of their students, some of their children in their class were designated late bloomers, even though they hadn't shown any um, academic uh, success, they are expected to bloom. The amazing thing is, that in a very short time, the teachers began to treat the children, those children differently than the other uh, kids. Those kids began to think of themselves differently, and in the end, they actually performed significantly better than the other kids. They were transformed by the teacher's positive expectations. The opposite of Jane Elliott's study, in which kid teachers' negative expectations that the teacher achieved led them to think of themselves as inferior. So let's see the Pygmalion effect in action in these classrooms set up by those people and they Positive expectations can change a person's perception of a situation just as dramatically as negative expectations. Psychologists call this the Pygmalion effect. 
after the George Bernard Shaw play of the same name, in which even an uneducated ragamuffin can be transformed into a proper society lady. In an experiment conducted at an elementary school like this one, psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson took the Pygmalion effect one step further. What we wanted to show was the extent to which teachers' expectations could actually affect pupils' intellectual performance, for example, their IQ scores. So what we did was we tested everybody in the school with a test that pretended to be a test that would predict academic blooming, so-called Harvard test of inflected acquisition. And allegedly on the basis of that test, but not really, we gave each of the teachers in the school the names of a handful of children in her classroom that would get smart in the academic year ahead. These kids' names were taken out of a hat. We, we chose them by means of a table of random numbers. The children themselves did not know in any direct way that uh, teachers were holding certain expectations for them. Teachers were told not to tell the kids, and of course we didn't tell the children either. So the children never knew. And then when we tested the children a year later, we found that those kids who had been alleged to their teachers to be showing or going to show intellectual gains, in fact showed greater intellectual gains than did the children of whom we'd said nothing in particular. So the kids actually got smarter when they were expected to get smarter by their teachers. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, so the rest of the video explains the reasons. These are the reasons. Um, going to be nicer. So Louise is a high attained student. I'm going to be nice to her. Welcome to my classroom. It's lovely to see you. I'm going to teach her more material. I think she's worth my time. Okay. Um, I give her more time to answer uh, because I think she's worth it. And I don't accept low quality response. Now the research is 60 years old the, in the primary classroom in America and the teachers by, by the researchers and the head teachers have said you've got the top set, you've got the bottom set. And a year later they measured the kids outcomes. And what they concluded was if you've got high expectation of your kids, or, or you're given certain preconceptions, it limits kids' uh, possibility, uh, outcomes. Um, 20 person next to you, 30 seconds, what do you think? Agree, disagree? Or do you suffer from Pygmalion effect yourself? Okay, five seconds. Okay. Now, four years ago, I shared this with people, live modern hands that you've got a visualizer. Okay, best thing that I ever put in my classroom 15 years ago. I do, we do, you do. As food teachers, you're brilliant at this. Kind of like, here's a pizza, kids, chop the vegetables in the oven. Brilliant. Okay, other subject areas maybe struggle. You know, maths teacher can model an equation, make a deliberate mistake. Kids, what have I done wrong? It's really important. If kids have not done it before, we need to encourage a climate and create it where I'm modeling what to do. Okay, and this is called live marking. Now, in my book, I've, I've shared seven areas of research. Okay, how just by simply marking your work in the lesson, by speaking to you, I can correct the work there, I create a dialogue in the room, and it's fast. Okay? Red pen, you do it all the time around the classroom, mark four or five kids' work. Instead of ch t uh, trying to do all 30, it's just say I'm going to do four this lesson and four the next. Then it becomes a bit more manageable. So live marking. Another idea I shared a while ago was yellow box. The Department for Education Research shared these three words. When you're marking kids' work, if it's not manageable for you, it doesn't mean anything or motivate Louise to want to fix the work, then it's probably not a very good strategy. Um, the yellow box I shared a long time ago, five years. I marked one thing. Give the kid feedback, 
and they redraft it. And essentially, the box determines how much work you want back. It doesn't have to be yellow. <laughs> OK? I see it as zonal marking. I'm a PE teacher. Kid can't hit, hit the tennis ball. I stand behind. Ross, turn your hips this way. Here's the ball. Velocity, et cetera, et cetera. Specific, explicit, one thing, fix it. Zonal, mark, zonal feedback. Find one thing and fix. There's a maths example. Rather than marking all the equations, find one, fix it, redraft, let's get it right, Ross. Okay, really nice idea. Feedback stamps, bin them. <laughs> it's compliance. It's tracking. Does that help a kid? No. It's good for me to come around and check in your books when I don't have time to talk to you and I'll sneak into your classroom in the corner and look in one or two books. Tell me, answer me the words. Is that meaningful for Louise? She gets that stamp. Louise, I've marked your work, now write it down and then actually then do it after you've written it down. I can do, run around the classroom, it's easy. Motivate Louise? Probably not. Show me the research. Context, primary classroom, smiley face. You, do my, you teach my son a spelling test, if he gets seven or eight or nine out of ten, he sits on the golden gala table for lunch. Ask yourself the questions. Could you stamp Freddie's spelling test every Friday? Yeah. Is it going to motivate him to learn to spell and do reading at home? Possibly. Is it motivating? Definitely is. The value is he loves coming to your class. His attendance is high. He loves reading. It's a different outcome. Okay? He still gets a good spelling test. Okay? So we need to consider context with everything. But, you know, when it comes to compliance, it's a difficult thing. If we do, like, even the yellow box, and it takes five minutes, here's the maths. Five minutes to do one thing, five and a half thousand minutes, 90 hours a day, 24, divided by 24, three and three quarter days of non-stop marking. No one works 24 hours a day, so that's seven, hours, seven and a half days of marking. If your school says, do the yellow box or the purple pen of progress once every week for every child, if you teach 30 kids, that's just one class. So you could potentially, if you teach five classes, that's 25 days of non-stop marking on top of your contracted hours. We need to change the narrative about marking and feedback. Um, I'm going to skip into one of the best strategies that I discovered 10 years ago, which is um, voice dictation. Does anyone use their voice to mark? A couple of people. I've written half my books, in fact, all my blogs and half Mark Plan Teach through voice. My head teacher a good three schools ago was paralysed from the neck down. And he used to use his voice through drag and dictate. So there's drag and dictate. You have to pay for that one. Google Docs is free. I'm going to show you this one. Evernote syncs to the cloud, as does this. And Cortana and Siri are on your phones. Speak to your phone. I'll do a demo now. So I've got a document open. Let's, let's see how we get on. Louise, comma. What a fantastic piece of work, exclamation mark. New paragraph. Why don't you use a ruler, question mark. I do that 30 times, print it off, Louise, stick that in your book, there's your feedback. Get on with it. Okay? Email to Louise. Louise, comma, thank you for allowing me into your lesson today. Full stop. What a wonderful atmosphere. Ellipsis. <laughs> oh, drag and dictate will do the three dots. Okay? You can see Google's, because it's free, it's a bit clunky, it's not as sophisticated. Etc. etc. Okay, it's fabulous. I've wrote all my blogs and books through speaking on my phone. So I'll give you a quick demo because this is probably the best thing I can give you today that will totally transform your workload and improve your mental health. So, I'm just going to switch to my camera. Give me one moment. I'm just going to open up my notes. Can we see that okay? Can we see that? Okay, click the microphone in the corner. I'm just demonstrating how easy it is to provide written feedback to a student simply by speaking into my phone, full stop. New paragraph. Imagine the possibilities this would open for me as a teacher, writing emails, comma, policies, comma, or marking students' work, full stop. New paragraph. I can produce three times the amount of work as the other teacher next door, full stop. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> and it got it as well, look, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> okay, so try it. Right, so what I want you all to do, you're going to have a quick 30 seconds of a practice. This is what I'd like you to say on your phone. So you need to find your phone, find your microphone on your keyboard, and could you speak, don't cheat and no typing, could you say that into your phone? 
and make it type it by itself. So a keyboard or Twitter or notepad or even on your browser for a website. Should be on your keyboard at the bottom. Um, so let's open. Where's your notepad? Uh, so we go into oh notepad. All right. Open a text message. Type a new message. There, microphone. Speak. Okay, five seconds. Okay. All right, everyone, stop having fun. You're not allowed to have any fun anymore. Okay, hands up if it worked. Yes. Okay, fantastic. About 25 teachers' lives saved. Okay, practice, practice. Right, quickly, uh, I want to spend more time on marking, so I'm going to just squeeze in plan and finish with teach. If you still do that, nonsense. Detailed lesson plans. I wrote lots of blogs to Ofsted last summer. Managed to get them to change the ITT guidance training teachers. You don't need to provide a detailed lesson plan for inspection anymore. Stop the nonsense. Five minute lesson plan or do you do doorknob lessons? That's high anxiety. Kids will catch you out. Yes, we all do it and we've all taught car crash lessons. We can't do this all the time either. 20 hours a day, sorry, 20 hours a week. We can't do that 20 hours a week. The five minute lesson plan, I don't say use the plan. I say it's a thought process. And when I did my MA 10 years ago, I literally took away a simple methodology. What, why, how, what if? What objectives? The big picture's in my head. I only share that if Louise asks for it when she comes to observe me. It's lesson four, Ross was absent last week. Lesson, we're teaching volcanoes. This is the objective. I'm gonna dress like a volcano to hook them in. But why, I want them to learn how to spell volcano and go home and whatever they're gonna do for the next lesson, bring it back. What sticks? How I do this is all my teaching strategies that are in my DNA. Red, amber, green flashcards, thumbs up, thumbs down, okay? Louise, how do you spell volcano? <laughs> if I don't ask and don't check, I can't assume she knows, okay? So the most powerful tool in a teacher's repertoire is questioning. I'm gonna finish with that today. What, why, how? The thought process, what if X, Y, Z stopped working or Louise wasn't in the lesson, okay? Stickability modes, for people that are more experienced, this is lesson one, volcanoes. Lesson two, how do volcanoes form? Lesson six, whatever we're on, when do I go back and talk about the volcanoes again? This is long-term retrieval practice, getting information into kids' work in memory. What do I want to stick each lesson throughout the curriculum? So when I come to lesson 22 and I test them, I've reminded them all the time of what we've been doing. Because if I surprise them at the end with a test, they're not going to get great results. Regular low-state testing works, and I mean quizzing. How do you spell volcano, Louise? B-O-L-C-A-N-O. So what you, Louise knows the answer. It's in her long-term memory. I'm now asking her to retrieve the information into her short-term processor and bring it to memory. That's what we do when we learn. And when we ask a teacher, te as a teacher asking a child question, that's what happens in your brain. Louise is under pressure. How much do I force her to get the answer out? But I'm also trying to manage her mental health, her social emotions in front of her peers. And that's what good quality teachers do. They manage all that dynamics in the behavior. Um, I'll skip this one. Uh, so there's a way. What did I teach you last month, kids? Last week, last lesson. Any questions? Let's clarify any misconceptions. How do you spell volcano, Louise? And then we move on. Okay, we'll go to the next lesson. So this is called retrieval practice. This is what cognitive scientists call retrieval. I retrieve the information from my long-term memory. Um, knowledge organizers, you heard of these? Okay, there's a food one. Okay, you can get, these are all on tests and on Google. Create your own one. That looks like a, at least a year 11 or year 12 level. I could be wrong, very detailed. Um, and, Lots of other things. So the last one, teach. I'm not going to go through all this, but this is 40 years of teaching and learning research by a chap called Barrett Rosenschein. Grab it on my website. It's 40 years of research of what things teachers do. The overriding message from this is I need to regularly review, check in what you know. 
Okay? And if I don't check in, uh, I don't know what to reteach. It's fascinating research. If you're on Twitter, you'll see me explain it in a little video as well. But um, the link inside the slides will take you to uh, the blog post. It's a three minute read. Okay? And I'm going to finish off with the most powerful thing you can do Fermi. Enrico Fermi was a statistician. He posed limited questions. Why? To encourage creative thinking. Turn to your partner. How many balloons can you fit into this room? Go. Okay. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on, hold on. I didn't tell you it was a hot air balloon. Yeah. Blown up. Okay, so contact. I gave limited information. What happened was I started a creative discussion. I deleted some emails. I talked to Louise outside. Mr. McGill walked past the door. Sir, can I have a quick word with you? Yeah, hold on. How many balloons, kids? Okay, or if I teach year one, I haven't got a cup. Hold up a cup. Year one, what would happen if I dropped this china cup? Discuss. I'll just talk to Louise outside and I'll be back in 30 seconds. It's great for workload. It gets creative discussions going straight away. Fun ones could be looking like this. Now, these are not curriculum examples because you all teach different things, but they might start to look like these. These are just fun. Okay? How many hairs on my head? What size are my shoes? How many teachers can you fit inside this room? How many Ofsted inspectors does it take to do X, Y, Z? Okay? Or Ross hates adjectives. He was never taught grammar at school. I want to hook Ross in. He's finding Macbeth really difficult. Ross, here's an objective. How many in the first paragraph of Macbeth? I hook him into Macbeth. He's counting the objectives. He gets lost in his learning. And then eventually I remind him, oh, Ross, you're learning Macbeth now. And what happens is, I'm going to just skip back to another slide. There's a chap called Cheek Zem Mahai. It took me ages to pronounce his name. Where is he? Um, here he goes. He talks about, on his TED talk and in his work, he's about 83, lives in the States, um, called the flow model. Ross doesn't like Macbeth. How do I move him to flow without over-challenging him, burning out, throwing a chair across the room? I'm not doing Macbeth. Oh, sir, your lessons are boring. We're doing a worksheet again. I then say, right, let's focus on objectives. You can choose. You want to do this paragraph, that paragraph, and here, or at the end of the lesson. I give you a clear objective. I speak to you in the lesson. Straight away, I feed back to you. How are you doing? And then what happens is, have you ever had a child say, miss that lesson went quick? Yeah. They've got lost in the flow. Technically speaking, they've been immersed in their learning, and that's what happens. Okay, and that's just one child. You've got to try and do that with 30. Okay, so we've got Fermi. I'm going to show you one more hinge question. It's a great assessment for learning technique. Testing retrieval what you already know. A right, right answer. Possible right answer, another possible right answer. So if I change the goalpost, how many balloons? Water balloons, hot air balloons. Or a definite wrong answer. So here's a food one. How many baked beans in one tin? <laughs> so what's the definite wrong answer? Have a quick argument with someone next to you. What's the definite wrong? <laughs> okay. What's the definite right one? Have a little argument. What do you say? Okay, five seconds, four, three, two, one. Okay, first of all, to support our subject knowledge domain, because it is a very explicit set of knowledge we're teaching, I have to defend this slide. Food is measured in weight, isn't it? Not by numbers of beans. So I'm going to clarify that one for you first. We are talking very technical here. But just for fun, for kids, for year seven, I could say, right, well, the definite wrong answer is 5,000. Or if I said it was a little microwave pot of beans, a little square tub, it might be 75, or the tin, or the big tin, or the small tin. Okay, and we can get them out, and we can count them if we want to, or we can let them have a concrete example. Psychologists call it a concrete example, or dual coding. Here's a tin of beans, feel it. Let's open one up and have a look, rather than just look at a slide. But what I can do at the start of the lesson, next lesson after we've done that, right kids, 30 seconds on your table, or while we're getting our books out and setting up, What's the right answer? Discuss. Good for your workload, good for retrieval practice. Retrieving information, because next lesson I'm talking about something else. It's a good way to test. Um, Doug Lamoff's book, Teach Like a Champion, I, I love his work. I talked about this last time I was here. Wait time. When I ask a question, I need to give you time to wait. 
If I wait one second, I put you under pressure. Well, what country was that chat from, that psychologist, Cheek Zen Mahai? Hungary. Now called out, ruined my question. Yeah. I, didn't, I need to set the conditions. <laughs> okay, hungry, yes, you're right. Okay, you must set the conditions for your question. It's a wait time. I then ask a question again. How many water balloons could you fill in this room? I wait five seconds. How many, sir? 100,000. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Ooh, let's discuss. So her research shows these things. Oh, we need to give kids time to process. When I put Louise under pressure at Spell Volcano, her cognitive reflex was, oh, I'm under pressure. Ross really wants me to say the answer. Okay? I need to give you time to think. So as a teacher, I have to create the conditions. Don't call out. I want you all to think. Share your answer and then tell me. One other thing. If I ask you to think about the question, how do I know that you're actually going to think about it? So a top tip, think, pair, share, think about the answer. How many Smarties can you fill in a coffee cup? Five seconds. <laughs> write down your answer. Write down your answer, everyone. Write it down. How many Smarties in a coffee cup? Now share your answer with the person next to you. Show them that you thought about the answer. Okay. Okay. All right, a couple more ideas, 10 minutes to go. So that's why that's important. Number four, we all need to take a turn. Everyone, hands down. Don't call out. Why? Because I want to make sure you're all listening. And I, when I ask you, I want you to give me the answer. And you need to learn to take a turn in life because your skills are still developing, and if you keep calling out and ruining it, or putting your hand, uh, uh, sir, me, 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 me. And I ask Louise, because it looks good, because when Mr. McGill observes me, it looks like my kids know the answer. It's conducive to learning. It looks good on the surface, okay? Um, pose, pause, pounce, bounce, bit of a mouthful on a Friday night, or the weekend after a bottle of wine. Pose the question, pause, wait five seconds, one, two, three, four, I can pause a little more. Bounce the question and pounce the answer or response to someone else. What do you think? Agree, disagree? I've written about that in the garden. You can dig that out. It's also on my site with all the resources. Um, and then what you can do over time, plan your questions. Do you have all your questions planned for a scheme of work? He says, waiting to get your slides uh, up. There's all questions for a structured scheme of work, year seven. I pose the question. I've got the question ready for Louise. End of the project about evaluate. How effective was your design? Pause. Give me a response. <coughs> bounce the answer to someone else. How you can get kids to do this for you really easy. I'm going to finish with the last idea and show you. I want you to watch this video. Why? Because I think it's the best thing you'll ever see. Let's go come for, come for, come for. Here we go. One of the most powerful things you can do as a teacher is to cold call. That means calling out kids regardless of whether they've raised their hands. When you cold call, you want it to be systematic. Watch how Harold Loftus does that. The first thing you'll notice is that it's pretty clear that everyone is going to get cold call. It's not personal, it's how she teaches. Well, let's go. Word one, what word, Cartier? Two, what word, Tatiana? Three, what word, Gia? Hannah's kids now know they have to be listening carefully and ready at any time. They're engaged even before they get called out. Word, Jameer. Seven, word, Marcellus. Very good, let's go talk to Hannah. The second crucial thing about Hannah's cold calling is that she's positive. Cold calls shouldn't be a gotcha. Not, what did I just say, Sarah? But a real question. And you want the student to get it right. Okay, when we left Edna and Carla, give me a quick synopsis. Of Let's watch Hannah one more time. Watch this girl here. She's going to call one of her students twice, which is a great way of showing them that they have to stay engaged, even after Emma's once. Good possible. Let's go. Word one, what word, Cartier? Two, a word. But notice Hannah's smile. Three, what word, Dion? Four, what word, Dion? Mysterious. Mysterious. Five-word, Jendai. That smile is a home run. The message is, we're in this together. I'm going to challenge you, and I'm happy when you succeed. And we can even have a little fun along the way. Okay, so you can see there that Dia knew the answer. Cognitive reflex. Oh, Mrs. Asking me, I need to think about it. Get it out of my mouth. And you can see her body reflex in that way. So reasons, what happens? Kids could be standing up or sitting down. doesn't matter. They know it's a technique. The best techniques teachers, uh, the most effective techniques are when teachers share how they work with their students. 
Okay, and rigor is important. And there's another, uh, in the toolkit pack limp I've sent you, um, toolkit pack, there's a video of a maths teacher with really hard equations, kids doing it on their feet. So, it's not personal, it's just how I teach. Could you stand up, please? I'm going to cold call you all. Okay, I'm going to try and get around the room. So, I'm going to set the conditions. Don't call out. I'm going to give you one second or five, depends on how I feel. I'm the teacher, but again, if I knew you, I'd know how far I could push you. Okay? When you get one second, you're going to feel under pressure. When you get five, you'll have a bit of time to think about it. I'm going to give you some obvious questions and some ones that you might not know. Okay? So let me just start off with a few um, simple ones. What is the capital city of Italy? Don't call out. Five seconds. Milan. Milan. It's, it's Rome. Okay? Okay. Are dolphins mammals or fish? Mammals. Mammals, correct. You're all panicking. Don't panic. What is the most commonly spoken language in the world? Mandarin. Where is Timbuktu? Continent? Um, Africa. Africa, northwest, east or south? West Africa, Mali, the country. Um, what is the longest river in the world? Yes, please. The Nile. Okay, I'll give you one second there. Um, five seconds. Which country is the second largest population? Um, China. India. China first, then India. Okay, and that's, that answers too many, 63 million people. How many days till Brexit? 29th of March. Okay, thank you, sit down. So you can get the idea, but then I could say, right, on today's context, what's stickability? Making learning stick. How does the yellow box work? Kids redraft their work. Okay, it's important to test. Opting out, I'm not going to show you this video, but inside this video, there's two clips of uh, two teachers. One teacher hands up kids, the other teacher hands down. And you can see the difference it does. When kids put hands up, they steer your lesson. Kids have the hands down, I steer my lesson. Okay, big difference. Again, context is key. Year one kids, year 11 kids, it might be very different. Okay, wrapping it up. Um, one more, don't stand up. I'm gonna do two things. Cold call, and if you get the answer wrong, no opt out. I'm also gonna do what's called a Fermi question, how many? a statistical question, and I'm going to um, ask you to retrieve something from your long-term memory to finish off. I want you to just read the sentence to yourself. Don't call out, don't speak. Okay. How many letter Fs are in that sentence? Two? Four? Three, there are six. No opt out, how many are in that sentence? Six, how many? Six, how many? Six. If I don't get you to practice the correct answer in classroom, it's gonna to be too late when you do the exam. Okay, now this sentence isn't in your long-term memory, it means nothing. When I say how many, I've changed your direction from what we learn into doing something. Okay, we're doing something, we're not learning something here, but I'm teaching you here the phonics. F is a F sound, of is an OV sound, okay? Our brain makes of redundant, it's so small and insignificant, let's ignore it, Ross has asked me a question in class, I need to get the answer quickly under pressure in front of my peers, okay? And we ignore all the small ofs, okay? So that's what happens, it's called redundancy effect. So look at the slide on the left, this is my last point. Bears enjoy eating honey. The teacher says it, the conference presenter says it, there's a picture and there's text. Too much information, my working memory gets overloaded. Let me chunk the information. So here we go. What's happening on the screen? Bears enjoy, Bears enjoy eating honey. Could you say that sentence for me, please? Bears enjoy eating honey. Bears enjoy eating honey. Everyone together, please. Bears enjoy eating honey. Dual coding, I put a little cuddly bear on your desk and a jar of honey. Taste the honey, kids. Dual code, I get you to practice the sentence in year two. I give you two ways to access the information and I chunk it into bite-sized bits. Barrett Roshenshine's work explains this. Um, 
So bears enjoy eating honey. The last thing, question matrix. You've seen this before? Hands up. Okay, a few people. Here, you choose a question here. Link it to a question at the top. So what is, what has, what might, or down the bottom, how is, how has. You get the idea. Stick an image on it. What is happening in this picture, lesson one? Lesson seven, which person got on the train first? How might we stop this happening again? I give the grid to the kids. They write their questions on a blank bit of paper. I have a big poster on the screen. Kids, post-it notes, exit entry cards. Stick your question up. Or print it in their books. Kids, stick it down, write the questions as we go through the scheme of work. Food lesson. Which olive oil should we choose? How might chilli affect the flavour? Suddenly, I've got 40 questions planned. And by the dynamics in my classroom, hands down, everyone's got to give me an answer. I've got my questions planned. If I give one to each kid, they write the questions down. I have 400 questions that I just work out which ones I'll keep, which ones I'll get rid of. Any image works. How did he get hit on the head? What's happening to him? What's happening in the image? Okay, English GCSE. Any image. Acetate, put it over the kid's work. Put it on your marking policies. Why do we have meetings every week? <laughs> Okay, now in the slides, in the, in the things I've given you, there's a grid, there's a blank one as well. Work out the questions. You might want to do these kind of things. Louise, these are your questions. Ross, this is yours. By the end of the lesson, by the end of the scheme of work, colour code the questions if you want to, etc., etc. Okay, fantastic resource. You've got your questions planned. I then meet my kids' needs in classroom on my feet <laughs> through the tools that I use in my vocabulary. Um, last thing, there's the resource. I haven't got through all the things I really wanted to do today. Toolkit pack. The slides you'll have, capital T, capital P. Let's just check what we talked about. This is what you said. Marking. Marking. We've got rid of marking. Look, it's gone. Planning, it's gone. <laughs> okay, we've done it. It's all gone. Okay, and then um, you also gave me feedback. So let me know how I did. If I don't ask, I don't know. I'm resetting it on your phone one last time. I'm watching this red face to see what happens. Okay, you need to ask for feedback. As colleagues, but also in the classroom, kids, how do you spell volcano? If I don't ask you, I don't know. Think about this answer. I don't know if you're thinking about it, so write it down. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Right. I've gone through all this. Okay? As much as I can. We need to reduce the amount of data we use. We need to replace the word marking with feedback. I didn't do number five. Um, Five-minute lesson plan. What sticks? Let's reduce the amount of time we spend lesson planning and make it a thought process. Let's trust them. Teachers need to plan, but let's trust them that they can do that. Um, and you've got all these questioning techniques at the end. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I've got two books, but I'm going to let Louise hand those out as prizes after I've gone, so I don't have the pressure. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we are big th again. Massive thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us again. Big hand. Thank you. It's brilliant. There are some really good things there. I'm really going to take back, and I'm sure you'll take some back snippets from there as well, as well as all those resources you can get through that link there. It's really very helpful. Thank you so much. You oh, had pleasure. over 200 people watching on Facebook from oh, Food right, Teacher Centre as well <laughs> as you were doing that. Oh, uh, so they watched snippets of that as well, and they've been posting some fabulous thank yous. So yeah, I said I passed those tweets as well. and selfies out. Let's speak up design technology, folks. Let's change the narrative. Thank you. Okay, so we're into the last workshop session of the day. Um, if my team can come down and help give out the bags as people go, no fighting, please, on the way out with those things. Um, the food presentation, styling, and photography, if they can just remain in the room but move towards the front uh, for that Thank first you. part of that well, session, pleasure. then you'll be off the practice. Thank you. Thank you.